So let's suppose we want to make our favorite burgers. So what's the first thing that we need to do? Yes, we need a list of ingredients, isn't it? So we take this ingredients list, we make the stack of the fine bread and the burger patty and we add the cheese in between and make a layer. And that's how we make our favorite burger, isn't it? But what if we are not making one burger? What if we are planning to throw a party with more than 50 people? So there'll be a lot of burgers now. So how do we achieve that by reducing the cost and time? For that, we need to make use of a recipe and thus reducing the production time. And this recipe will become the template for our burgers. But what if we are not making burgers? What if we are deploying our products? So how do we create our templates to deploy applications? That would be interesting, isn't it? Thanks everyone for joining in for today's session on AWS and let's talk about a very interesting service which is highly in demand right now. And yes, let's talk about AWS CloudFormation and if you're ready, let's begin. And before moving forward, join me in congratulating our very own Pytholics Hall of Fame members, Deeksha, Alfonso, Kishan and Subhashni for they have successfully achieved their Solution Architect Associate Certificates. Please put your wishes in the comment section below and if you also want to be a part of the Hall of Fame members list, please tag the channel with your certificates in LinkedIn. It really helps me feel very happy and motivated to make these videos and also helps the channel grow. Awesome job guys, keep them coming. Thanks everyone for this love and support and it really helps me a lot. And in today's session, we will talk about infrastructure as code and we will try and understand why is it important and why is it so much in demand right now. And we will see why primitive deployment strategies are being overtaken by infrastructure as code. And we'll obviously talk about what is AWS CloudFormation, what is the benefit of using that, and how does CloudFormation work, how do we control access in AWS CloudFormation, and we'll also do a small hands-on demo for AWS CloudFormation. And in the last community post, I had asked you a question on CloudFormation that was in that was, let's suppose our developers regularly create and update CloudFormation stacks using API calls, so for security reasons, we need to ensure that users are restricted to a specified template. So how can this be achieved? And these are the four options that I had mentioned there. What's the right answer to this? Hmm. We need to wait for that as I'll explain to you why the answer that we have is the right one and how do we deduce it or how do we come to the conclusion in choosing the right one. So watch the video till the end. And if you're new to the channel, then please do subscribe. It really makes me happy and uh, helps the channel grow and you know what it's free <laughs> so having said that let's start off with our today's session on cloud formation so infrastructure as code is something that is highly regarded in our community our cloud community but what is infrastructure as code is it a sort of code that helps create our infrastructure or is it something like we write a program and our infrastructure gets built automatically or is it a combination of both and why are we even talking about infrastructure as code with AWS CloudFormation? So let's find out. So when you will be working as a DevOps engineer or even a cloud architect, the most challenging thing for you will be managing the infrastructure. So how well you're going to handle failures, how fast you're going to bring up the application platform, how are you going to have a smooth transition and deployment? These are some of the questions to which you will try and find answers almost like every time you step out for a new design review. But since the time cloud has come into the picture, it has totally changed the game of how applications are being deployed and how things are managed in this world where the competition levels are sky high. But what is infrastructure as code? So listen to this very carefully. I took this from Wikipedia, but it's really good. It says, Infrastructure as code is the process of managing and provisioning computer data centers through machine readable definition files rather than physical hardware configurations or interactive configuration tools. So before I explain you the above term in detail, let's see the visual here. So we have a developer who writes the code for the infrastructure deployment. 
that is being source controlled using a version control application like Bitbucket or SVN or GitHub. That is our infrastructure code commit. And that code is being consumed by the automation stage by the cloud service provider to deploy the application either on the cloud platform or in the on-premise environment. And this is the placeholder for the automation and this is your template to create infrastructure and that is what you commit and make use of. So when they say infrastructure as code is the process of managing and provisioning computer data centers through machine readable definition files, it means I am using a blueprint or a template code rather than physical hardware configuration or interactive configuration tools to provision resources and manage my infrastructure. So the thing that we are going to use is a code that is going to manage our infrastructure. And that is why it is called infrastructure as code. So you being a developer who writes the code for the infrastructure deployment that is being source controlled by a version control application like Bitbucket or SVN or GitHub. And that code is being consumed by the automation stage where you actually automate the cloud provisioning. And that is taken up by this cloud service provider that you have like AWS to deploy the application either on the cloud platform that we have or in the on-premise environment. And that is why it is called as infrastructure as code. So now do you understand what is the importance of the recipe to make the burger? Let's change things now and see the same for cloud. In the cloud, your list of ingredients would be like your VPC, EC2 instances, your CloudWatch, IAM and services that you might use to construct or deploy your application. And that is what makes up for the template or the blueprint that you deploy or the template that you use to deploy the applications and automate your infrastructure. So now if I tell you, you just need to write a piece of code to automate your deployments for your infrastructure deployment and it will be up in a moment, wouldn't you feel that it's just like magic? Yes, it is. It is a form of magic, but it is not uh, actual magic that happens, but it is your code that is doing the magic here. But out of curiosity, if you just ask yourself, but why there was a need for infrastructure as code, then we have to find out the answer for that as well. And let's check that out. So let's understand what is the problem. The first thing is cost or the first thing was cost. If I ask you to do something and I would pay you about five bucks for every time you perform the task, let's suppose I need multiple tasks to be completed and I need to manage hundreds of resources. Some might be able to do that on time and some may not be, isn't it? So here, what is the first thing that we are losing? No, it's not money, it's time. And time is something that adds up in future costs of managing resources to accomplish the task. And managing resources is something that costs you time and money and resources. And with infrastructure as cloud, it is much more simplified because you have a set template to execute every time you need to create a deployment. So now you understand why cost is a factor. Cost is not always about money. It is about time and the resources as well. Second thing is scalability. So the reason why scalability was a problem because we can't just wait for things to happen and we can't wait for the applications to scale and be managed manually when the demand is growing. And it's not like spinning up EC2 instance. I know you might be thinking I'll create an auto scaling group, but my friend, when we deploy an application, there might be more than 30 to 40 services and there will be more than 50 to 60 EC2 instances running and each of them should be configured on the go to manage time and scalability. And that was not possible manually. And if that's not possible to manage, and if you have to create backup servers and provision resources when you get the need, that would be a disaster because people would have to wait for a long period of time to access their application. And that's where our third point is being covered. That is availability. The resources at a given point of time should be available to the users. Otherwise, there is no point hosting your application. Last one is inconsistency. As I've already mentioned in the first point as well, let's suppose I need multiple tasks to be completed by the DevOps team and I have to manage hundreds of resources. So some might be able to do the task on time and some may not be able to. 
And it's not just time, there might be differences and errors due to manual configuration deployment that could lead to a collapse in deployment because as humans, doing repetitive tasks may not be as accurate and you can't blame people for making mistakes. Yes, that is a scope of improvement and that is why we follow the process, but there will be inconsistencies. And that is one of the main benefits of using infrastructure as code, that is consistency. That is why we always think how consistent our application deployments can be. And with infrastructure as code, it has become very efficient and consistent. So now if you see this, you will have a clear idea of how things work in real world. The crux of the automation is the automation staging where you make use of the cloud service provider to manage resources and provision resources. So imagine this scenario, the DevOps team or the SRE team just writes a code to deploy an application and they just have to push it. Once it's reviewed, the code actually gets committed to the versioning pool and the automation staging takes the code and deploys it either on the cloud or on your on-premise data center. And what is that you did? Did you manually deploy each service? No. Did you provision them manually to auto scale on demand? No. You just wrote the template or the blueprint for it to work. And that's what IAC or infrastructure as code is bringing onto the table. And that's the simplicity IAC is going to give you. And that's what cloud formation is all about. So now you are ready to get started off with cloud formation. The first line in the documentation says it all for AWS cloud formation. Speed up cloud provisioning with infrastructure as code. When we keep on doing the same things or when we try and improve things constantly, continuous integration and continuous delivery play a huge role in IT automation. And when I say this term infrastructure as code, think it in a way like you are treating your infrastructure, your deployment plan, your deployment blueprint, your strategy, your design, as a form of code rather than manually deploying services or individual services. So I'll repeat this once again when I'm saying this term infrastructure as code, think it in a way like you're treating your infrastructure, your deployment plan, your deployment blueprint, your strategy, your designs as a form of code rather than manually deploying services or individual services. You can manage and provision stacks across multiple AWS accounts and AWS regions using the templates that you have for cloud formation. I know you might be thinking what is a stack, just have some patience and keep watching, I'll tell you. And as you can see rightly below, we have mentioned the base of how cloud formation actually works and these are the steps. The first one, infrastructure code commit. And this step that is basically the most important step is where we write the code for our deployment from scratch using the cloud formation template format, that is the language. So you can make use of JSON or YAML and we can actually save it with the extension of .template or .json or .txt or .yaml. And the second one is you upload the code to AWS S3 or Amazon S3, that is your template. So you can make use of the code stored in your local machine or else you can pull it from the S3 bucket. So the third step is once you have your code, you make use of cloud formation to execute your plan before which you will get an outlook on your topology of your design on the console based on which you can make the decision on whether you want to proceed further to execute it. For this, you can also use the console or you can make use of the SDK or else you can make it work with the CLI as well. And once you have made the decision, then comes the last step. That is where you see the magic unfold. The cloud formation will get your resources provisioned with the template that you have provided. And that's how it works. So step one, write code. Step two, upload to S3 or use it from your local file. The third step is execute on cloud formation. And the fourth step is get the resources. That's all, isn't it? It's very simple. So there are so many benefits of using cloud formation, but I have mentioned a few of them here. So the first one is to simplify infrastructure management. So this is very important because when we think of a scenario where you are handling a lot of traffic, it would be very cumbersome and problematic if you try changing configurations manually. So how will you determine the right provisioning strategy? It's not easy to do that on the fly, isn't it? But with cloud formation, you have already written the configuration and the scaling code and the condition and the condition to which you want the scaling to take place. And even though you feel it's not working properly, just make changes to the template. 
CloudFormation will deploy the delta and won't disturb the existing deployment. Second one, quickly replicate your infrastructure. So this is also a very interesting one. Let's suppose I give you an example here. So we have an application deployment and that's on the test environment. So we want an exact replica to be created on our test environment. So how can we do that? So just use the template. You have all the information that you need. It's simple, isn't it? And that's why we can quickly replicate the infrastructure just by using the template itself. The third one is also very important. Easily control and track changes to your infrastructure. So tracking your resources is very important and that's very useful because if I ask you to give me details of your current deployment, you don't have to pull your design documentation. You can just share the template with me and the input file. I'll upload them. And let's suppose you want to see what instance types are being used. And if you wish to upscale them, you already know what the current configuration is. So this actually makes it very simple when you want to draw down information about your current deployment. So these are some of the benefits of using CloudFormation and I absolutely, I think I love it. So if you need to work with CloudFormation, you need to understand these three concepts very clearly. The first one is template. The second one is stacks. And the third one is chain set. So let's start with template. So as I already told you in this step, that is basically the most important step is where you write the code for your deployment from scratch using the CloudFormation template format. That is the language that we have. So you can make use of JSON or YAML. And we actually can save it with the extension of .template or .json or .txt or .yaml. And that is your template. And as I mentioned here, the template acts like your blueprint for creating the AWS resources for you. It can also be a JSON, YAML file, extension like .yaml, .json, .txt and .templates can be as a part of that. And you can also specify multiple resources in a single template and configure these resources to work together. Second one is stack. Imagine the burger, it has layers, isn't it? Like a patty and the lettuce and the cheese. Think in cloud terms, your resources like EC2, IM, CloudWatch, STS, RDS databases, these will be like your technology or service stack, which will form your application design. So as I mentioned here, you manage multiple resources as a single unit, that is like having a stack at one place. So you create, update and delete a collection of resources by creating, updating and deleting stacks. Not only one, but multiple resources at once. So for example, having a EC2 or auto scaling group, CloudWatch, RDS at one place. And the third one is chain set. So this is also a very important one. So now that you have your template, you are ready for your deployment and you execute it and you get your application or the infrastructure deployed. But what if you want to make changes to that? Yes, you can make changes by rolling out chain sets. Remember that. If you want to make changes, you can roll out chain sets, which act as a delta for your application deployment. Let's suppose you want to add a new service or you want to increase or decrease service configuration. You can do that as well. So you basically generate a chain set when you want to make changes to the resources. It acts like a summary for your proposed changes. So you see what you are changing before it's being implemented on your cloud formation. It will show you the changes that you have and then you can decide if you wish to deploy it. So I hope you got the points here. The first one is template. The next one is stack or the resource stack. And then you have your chain set. So let's understand the working of cloud formation carefully once again. So here, let's suppose I want to create a pool of EC2 instances and have a load balancer attached to it with the ASG in place. So first I can write the template or use an existing template that I have where I mentioned the instance type, the storage I want, how many instances should be in the auto scaling group and we will create an elastic load balancer and attach the targets. Next we will save the template in S3 to keep it secure so that it does not get changed or deleted or lost somewhere and then we execute it using CloudFormation service and if we wish to make changes then we write a chain set for that. And once we execute it using CloudFormation, it will provision the resources and will create a EC2 instance or a pool of EC2 instances and it will attach a load balancer to it and it will have an auto scaling group in place. So it will do that automatically for us. And I don't have to manually do that one by one. So I can just write everything in the template and once I feed that to AWS CloudFormation, it will give me the total output. So here is one example as well for the template for CloudFormation to create EC2 instance. So we have the AWS template format version 
2010-0909. This is one of the versions that we already have here. And the description is let's create an EC2 instance. So here we are trying to read the template. So please pay full attention. The next one is resources. So resources key is very important where you actually mention what is the resource that you're going to create. So the resource name that I have given is my EC2 instance. There's the first and the only resource we have here. So I hope you guys are aware of YAML. There's a template written in YAML. So if you are not aware of YAML, there is a video in my channel explaining how YAML works. You can check that out as well. And the type of resource is AWS EC2 instance. You can find these resource names in the documentation for the supported services in AWS for CloudFormation. Not to be worried about that. You will get the name of any of the services that you want to use in CloudFormation. Then we mentioned the properties of the resources that we want. So the resource name is my EC2 instance. And what is the property? I'll mention it under the properties key. So the first is the AMI that I want to use, the image ID. So AMI name, I have to provide the AMI name. The second one is the instance type. What type of instance that I want? I want t2.micro, t2.small, t2.large, whatever I want, I can mention that. Third one is the SSH key. So for my SSH or port number 22, I have to use a key that I can log in with using SSH. So EC2 hyphen key is my key that I've used. And then I have mentioned the storage. So next is storage, that is the EVS volume mount. So the key that I've used for EBS is block device mapping. And under that, we have the device name slash dev slash SDM. Then EBS configuration is basically your volume type that is IO1. IOPS is 200, delete on termination is false and volume size is 20 GB. So that's how we read a simple template. And once we write a template like this, we simply upload it to CloudFormation and to S3 and execute it using CloudFormation. So once you have written this template, this type of template, you can simply upload to S3 and you can make its execution from CloudFormation as well. So it will provision you the EC2 instance that you have written the template for. So now let's see what happens if we want to make changes to the existing deployment made using CloudFormation. So in our existing deployment, we create EC2 instance using CloudFormation. Now our requirement changed and we want to have Elastic IP attached to it. So here, the best thing is you don't need to do anything manually. We keep the existing template and then we create our chain set. That is the proposed change that we want to make. So what does the chain set contain? So it has the resource name that is my IP or my EIP that is my Elastic IP. And the resource type is Elastic IP that I have here. So the type is AWS colon EC2 colon EIP. So that is the resource type for Elastic IPs. And in the properties, I have mentioned instance ID, that is the reference for my EC2 instance. So it has to attach to that particular instance, isn't it? So we have to give a reference ID for that to what instance it is going to be attached to. So the instance ID that I have is my instance ID. So I have given it here. And once you've done this, once you've written this template, that's all. Commit your chain set, see the changes and execute it. No more changes are required. And that's the beauty of infrastructure as code. So here is a working mechanism of the chain set. At first, we have our original stack of our resources. And first step, that is we create our chain set. Second, we view our chain set to make the decision if we wish to apply them. If not, we just revert or make some changes again. And that is the last step that we have. That's the fourth step. We execute the change. So you have the original stack. If you wish to make any changes, you create the chain set. So once you have made the chain set, you see that you view that on the console or the viewing page that you have the chain set that you have created. If you're satisfied, you move ahead and execute the chain set. If not, you come back again and you create another chain set or you make additional changes to that. Isn't it? So that's how simple it is. So you have the original stack, you create the chain set, you get your satisfaction <laughs> done once you have created it. If you're fine with that, then just go ahead and execute it. So as it's mentioned here as well, we added the template and make the changes. That is our chain set. Then we save the changes on the S3 bucket by uploading it. And then we use CloudFormation to generate our chain set. And then we view our chain set so that we make the decision if this is a valid change or if we need some more changes. And then using CloudFormation, we execute our chain set and make changes to our environment as per our chain set that we have. So chain set is basically the changes that you want to see in your existing deployment using CloudFormation. 
But having said all this, it is very important for us to ensure that our templates are secured so that only the right person or the right people can make change to it or can make changes to it. Because if it's a production template, we can't take chances, isn't it? So let's understand how we control access to these templates. So now let's talk about controlling access to CloudFormation using IAM. So what can we do with IAM? Let's understand that. So with IAM, we can control what users can do with AWS CloudFormation. That's a pretty straightforward thing to say, but there's much more complicated than you might think. So we can control access such as whether they can view stack templates or create stacks or delete stacks. And we can also specify some granular permissions as well to which users can actually create Amazon EC2 instances, terminate database instances or update VPCs. Those same permissions are applied anytime they use CloudFormation to do those actions as well. Here this is interesting because if I restrict an IAM user that it cannot create an EC2 instance, if the same user uses a template that contains a resource creation for EC2, he won't be able to do it or he won't be able to create it because we have restricted the user to certain resources. So if I restrict its IAM policy or the IAM user that he cannot use EC2 or it cannot create an EC2 instance, even if it tries to do that using a cloud formation template, it will not be able to do that. The same way we do it for other resources and templates as well. So let's try and read these policies for IAM. So the first one that we have here is IAM policy view stack permission. So here, we have four actions in our policy for describing stack, stack events, stack resources and resources. So this is just for a user who can view the stack. So if you see, we have the policy. So when you're reading a policy, as I've already told you before, you must specify or you must focus on the statement. So the statement will give you an option to see what is the effect. So the effect will be either allow or deny based on which your actions will be defined. So in the first policy that you see here, we have the action or the effect as allow and the actions are describe stack, describe stack events, stack resource, stack resources. So this user having the resource as star, it means that on all the resources, wherever this action is applicable, they are allowed to do that. So here, so this is just for a user who can view the stack. But what about the users who actually shouldn't be allowed to make changes like deleting or updating? Let's see that IAM policy here. So this IAM policy denies the delete and update stack actions for the my production stack. So here, if you see, we have the policy, the statement here. So the statement effect is deny. So it means that any user who has this policy will be denied action on deleting a stack or updating a stack. They can create a stack, but they cannot delete it or they cannot update it. And what is the resource they are restricted to? That is basically your my production stack. And they can perform their operations only on that particular stack itself. So we have a policy here that grants create and view stack actions. So first thing is that you have to notice that is effect that is allow. It means we are allowing the action. And what's the action here? So we have these five or six actions like create stack, describe stack, describe stack events, describe stack resources, get template, validate template. And on what resource that we have here, it is marked as star. So it means you are allowed to make changes on all resources which have the action as mentioned above and not to a specified template. So remember when you have star or asterisk in your resource, it means you need to look at the action. And it means you aren't restricted to a particular AWS resource name and you are restricted only to the actions that you're going to perform. So now this is something that is really important and you might have to use this IAM policy. So, so please pay attention to this. So there will be a situation where a team or a pool of users work on a single template and we need to control access to it. So how do we do that? Of course, by using IAM, we can do that. But how? <laughs> so here we need to make use of a condition called cloud formation template URL which takes an Amazon S3 template URL as an input that you want to associate with a policy. So using this condition, we can control which IAM users can manage this template when they create or update stacks. So there is an important point that we need to talk about. So to ensure that IAM users 
can only create or update stacks with the templates that you uploaded, set the S3 bucket to read only for those users. So that's also a very interesting point here. So we have the allow state for the effect. So the effect uh, is allow for the action that is cloud formation create stack, cloud formation update stack. So user can create stack and user can also update the stack, but it cannot delete it. Remember that. And based on the condition that we have cloud formation colon template URL. So that is the template URL name that we have specified for the S3. So that is HTTPS slash s3.amazonaws.com slash test bucket slash test dot template. So that is the template name that we are going to use or we are going to restrict. So we have mentioned the template URL for that. So the users can only create an update stack using that template. So when I read this an Amazon S3 template URL that you want to associate with a policy, use this condition to control which template IAM users can use when they create or update stacks. There must be something that will be going around in your mind, isn't it? That is because this answers our question, which I asked you a couple of days back. Let's check that out. And the question that I asked was, let's suppose our developers regularly create an update cloud formation stacks using API calls. For security reasons, we need to ensure that users are restricted to a specified template. So how this can be achieved. And the options were create an IAM policy with a condition stack policy URL template, create an IAM policy with a condition resource type parameter, store template on S3 and use a S3 bucket policy to restrict access, or create an IAM policy with a condition template URL parameter. So what's the right answer? Yes, it's option D, create an IAM policy with the condition template URL parameter, as you might have already guessed by now because that is what we just discussed right now. The first option was create an IAM policy with the condition stack policy URL parameters. So we use this condition to control which stack policies IAM users can associate with a stack during a creation or updating stack policies or a stack action. So this is just to associate a stack policy, not for a template. So it's ruled out. The second one was create an IAM policy with the condition resource type parameters. So this is to specify a specific custom resource type like AWS EC2 instance or Elastic IP or RDS. So that's also ruled out. The third one was store template on S3 and use bucket policy to restrict access. So the bucket policy that you have can restrict read and write access to the bucket and that would apply to all the objects inside it, not to a particular template. You cannot make conditional access using S3 bucket policies for templates. So that's also ruled out. You can only do that if you want the access to be restricted to anyone that is going to use it. But for the last one that we have here, create an IAM policy with a condition template URL parameter. And that was our right answer because by using template URL, you can restrict access to a specific template. That's what our question was because our question had a condition as for a security reason, we need to ensure that users are restricted to a specific template or to a specified template. So by using template URL, you can restrict to a template itself. And that's how we isolate the correct answer. So I hope you are clear with the concept here. Let's move on. So now let's talk about the last topic at hand for cloud formation that is regional support for stack sets. So there might be confusion around like is cloud formation restricted to a specific account or region or is it like multi region or can I execute it from any one region only and I can surely understand your doubts on this. So first of all, I want to clear it out that cloud formation is a regional service unlike IAM and S3, it's not a global service. But having said that, there will be scenarios where you want to create, update or delete stacks across multiple regions or accounts with a single operation, isn't it? For this as well, we have the provision using CloudFormation stack sets. With CloudFormation, we create the stack and we can use the template to deploy our applications or infrastructure or stack as we call it to other AWS accounts and in other regions as well. But for that, we need to make use of administrative account or the administrator account. 
So if you wish to create an administrator user, you can create it using IAM by granting admin rights to that user in IAM. And if you see here, we have the stack created by the admin account and by using the ARNs, and we can apply the same stack to a target A, target B in region A and region B as well. So in the documentation, there is a very important point that has been mentioned. So a target account is the account into which you create, update or delete one or more stacks in your stack set. And before you can use a stack set to create stacks in your target account, you must set up a trust relationship. So understand this very carefully. And before you can use a stack set to create stack in your target account, you must set up a trust relationship between the administrator and the target accounts because you need the permissions to execute the operation, isn't it? But even though you can make use of the stack sets to create stacks across multiple regions, you must remember that a stack set is a regional resource. And if you create a stack set in one region, you cannot see that or change it in any other region. Okay, so you have your stack set in one region and you can create stacks in other regions, but you cannot use that same stack set in other regions as well. So stack set is different than stack. So a stack set will be a collection of stacks that you can create across multiple regions or accounts. So that's what I've mentioned here. Like if you create a stack set in one region, you cannot see it or change it in any other region. So that's it for stack sets. And before moving forward, I want to mention that when you make use of cloud formation, you create stacks and that is where you apply your template to provision resources. So there is a separate option in cloud formation as well, where you can create stack sets. So don't get confused here. So now that we have learned a lot about cloud formation, let's check out a small hands-on demo for this. But before that, if you still haven't subscribed, then please do it right away. It's free and it really helps the channel. So it's my request to you to please support me by hitting the like button and clicking on that subscribe button as well. Having said that, let's move on. So if you wish to use your AWS cloud formation, go to the AWS management console and just type cloud formation here. So if you just type cloud formation, you will get this option. Now you can click on this to go to cloud formation here and we'll just do that. So just click on cloud formation. So as it is rightly mentioned here, AWS cloud formation provides a common language to describe and provision all the infrastructure resources in your environment in a safe and repeatable way. And that's what we want to achieve, isn't it? So the most important thing here is to understand that we need to use this button that we have here, create stacks to create our first stack, isn't it? So just click on that and you will get a form to create your stack. And here, as you can see, we have three options to basically select our template. So every stack is based on a template. A template is a JSON or YAML file that contains configurations, information about the AWS resources that you want to include in your stack. So when you choose template is ready, then it is understandable that you already have a template that is being uploaded already in the AWS S3 bucket, or you can upload it. Don't have any templates right now. You can just select on this one and choose a sample template. There are a lot of templates here. And if you want, you can just click on this to design it as well. You can create your own designs using the designer. I can just open it right now. So this is the cloud formation designer. And if you wish to create any design that you want for your application, you can just do that. Let's suppose you want to create an EC2 instance, just uh, go to EC2. And if you have this, you can just drag the instance here. And let's suppose you want to have a launch template. You can add it here. And same way, if you want to have any other auto scaling groups as well, you can here add it here by dragging and dropping and you can create your designs. So once you have this design here, you will get the code mentioned below here. So this is one way to create your template, but we are not going to do this way. You can just leave this. So we are going to upload a template. So I found this template already. There are a lot of templates in the documentation that you can find. So I actually downloaded a template that creates an EC2 instance with the Elastic IP. So I will upload this template. So I'll just click on upload template file and I'll click on choose file and I'll just upload it. So this is my template. And once you have this template, it will get uploaded in your AWS S3. And if you don't have, or if you don't 
specify a particular Amazon S3 URL, it will create a bucket for you. So this is the bucket that will be created for me, cf-templates. This property name that I have in the region that I have created, so IP South 1 because I have chosen Mumbai. And as you can see, it is a region-based service, CloudFormation, you can create it in any region that you want. And based on that, it will upload the template for me. And once I have uploaded this template, I can just click on view in designer to see the design as well. See, I'll just drag this down. And if you see here, so this is the instance, this is the elastic IP that we have associated and this is the security group. So this template actually creates a EC2 instance, attaches a EC2 elastic IP and it provides a security group for SSH. So if I click on the instance, it will go to the instance where I told you like we will be provisioning resource within which we will type the resource name. That will be the resource type here, AWS EC2 instance. Then I will provide a reference for the IP address. This IP address is going to come from this elastic IP. So don't worry about that. And the security group is going to come from the instance security group ID here. So let's suppose I want to just see so let's suppose I just want to see the security group. I'll click on the security group type. And here it is showing me that this is the resource name. So that is instance security group that I've given here. And this is the type of the instance or the type of resource that I have, the AWS EC2 security group. So you have to make sure that you know what is the resource type that you're going to use. So you just have to copy paste that and use it. And within that, the properties that we have is enable SSH access. So the in protocol or the IP protocol that we have is TCP that is for the security group ingress or the inbound traffic and from port is 22 to port is 22 side block is SSH location that is the inbound rule that we have and then the elastic IP configuration. So this is the elastic IP configuration. This is the elastic type, uh, the, the target type that we have or the resource type that we have that is AWS AC2 elastic IP and the IP association will be coming from elastic IP associations. That's it. So once you are happy with the template and uh, you're satisfied with this, you can just close it. You can just click on next. And here you can provide the stack name that we have. Here is hello stack. So this is my stack name. And uh, for the demo, I just can use t2.micro. So that does not affect me. And the key name that I have is ec2 hyphen key. That's the SSH key that I want to give. And this is basically your SSH security group IP address range that you want to give. So basically I want to give it a public access. So it's not a problem. I can just provide a side block of 0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, slash 0 that is from everywhere. So I don't have any problem with that. But based on your requirement and based on your security protocols that you have for your organizations, that will be different. And this is just a very small demo. So I just want you to show like how simple it is to create your templates but it is going to be a lot more difficult when you're working with a whole set of production environments so don't worry about that right now just stay focused on what we're discussing here because once you have a small step that you have taken forward then you can do big things after that that's what i feel so just click on next and add a tag name hello stack and the IAM rule that we have, I don't want to give any IAM rules because I don't think so there is anything that we need to provision here. And uh, stack policy, no stack policies, I think we are not going to provide any stack policies here and rollback configuration. So here, this is also a very interesting part because when you're provisioning resources using cloud formation, usually always it may not be going smoothly and there might be problems in some of the deployments, isn't it? So if we specify alarms, for cloud formation to monitor when creating and updating the stack. So if the operation actually breaches an alarm threshold, cloud formation rules it back. So based on your condition that you have and based on the alarm that you are currently setting based on like, so let's suppose there should be always five EC2 instances after you create the deployment. And uh, what has happened is due to some error, two of the instances are getting terminated continuously. So you set alarm there and based on that, it is trying to fetch you the result back and it's going to uh, roll the infrastructure back. So this is just an example. 
I'm not telling that that's the exact scenario. I'm just telling like, let's suppose there are some of the errors that are coming like in your CPU utilization or based on the transaction that you have for your databases, you have set your alarms. And based on the alarms that you have, if it breaches an alarm threshold, it will roll back the deployment. The cloud formation actually will roll back the deployment. So that is what your rollback configuration actually means. So here you can provide the monitoring options like monitoring time and CloudWatch alarm. So you can provide the alarm based on which it will check the threshold values for that. So now we don't have anything like this. So we can just close it. Notification options, you can actually, uh, let's suppose you want to be notified when the deployment is complete or if suppose a particular stage is complete also, you can just provide a SNS topic here. Now there is a stack creation option as well. So rollback on failure specifies that the stack should be rolled back if the stack creation fails. So if suppose the creation or the stack creation actually fails, you can just roll back and it is enabled by default. You can actually disable it if, it, if you want to just uh, see what is the problem and there is a timeout also like it should not go like uh, for years together so if suppose you are feeling like it should be timing out within 60 minutes or 30 minutes of initiation and it uh, actually gets timed out before that then also it is fine then you can mention the time that you want to specify for the timeout otherwise it will keep on getting stuck and it will be hung there in that state so we don't want that termination protection so prevents the stack from being accidentally deleted once created you can update this through stack actions so we don't want the stacks to be deleted accidentally isn't it so we just want to have the termination protection enabled for that but for now we don't have anything like that so we can just keep it as disabled just close this and click on next so this is the review hello stack so once you have created your template and you have uploaded it you can just see what exactly your uh, template looks like or what exactly your review stack looks like. So this is a very straightforward uh, stack policy that we have here. There is nothing much details that to be reviewed. So we have the instance type, we have the key name, we have the SH location and we have the template URL that we have that we uploaded just now. And once you've reviewed this, you can actually create a quick link, but I don't want to do that. And you can just click on create stack. So once you have created the stack or once you have clicked on creation of the stack, you can actually monitor the progress in this console as well. So that's the one of the beautiful parts that I feel. So this is the events and these are the resources that are being created. The EC2 instance, the IP address and the instance security group that you have provided in your template. And the output configuration that we have, the output, there is the output there in the template that I'll show you after uh, we have seen this and these are the parameters that are used for the template and this is the template as well there's the complete template that we have here so these are the output details also you can mention so once you have your template you can mention the output in the templates as well so you will get an instance id and the instance ip address so instance id is the id that will be created once the instance is created the ec2 instance is created and the instance IP address is the elastic IP address that we will have for the instance that we are going to create. So we can just go to events and we can see there are a lot of events that they have taken place that have taken place. So it started off with create in progress for the hello stack. It created the IP address. So it is in progress right now. The instance security group is in progress. So the instance security group is still in progress. Now it has created the instance security group. It has created the IP address. It has completed the EC2 instance creation. So it has create complete. And then it has uh, associated the IP address that we have for the elastic IP. I'll just refresh it once again. Uh, then it has completed the creation of the IP association. And then the logical ID that we have at the hello stack that is for the template itself is complete because we can see it has been completely created. So now our stack is completely created. So now if you see here, we have all the resources that we wanted to create, they are already done. So the EC2 instance ID is this, the elastic IP that I wanted to attach for is this, and the instance security group has been created like this. So I can view each of them from here as well. And the output that I was mentioning here is like this one. So there's the IP address of the newly created EC2 instance. And there's the instance ID of the newly created EC2 instance that we have. So there's basically your elastic IP that we wanted to create. And if you go to the template section and if you go to the outputs, 
So if you see here, the reference is IP, right? So you can just click on that and do a control F and you can search for that IP address. So IP address, this is the resource and the type is elastic IP and the association that we are doing is instance ID and the elastic IP. So this IP address is going to be attached to this instance ID EC2 instance that is using the EIP association. So you create your instance using EC2 instance, this type resource type, you create your IP address using elastic IP, you create an association between the instance and the IP address using elastic IP association and you create your security group using AWS EC2 security group. Similarly, there are so many other AWS uh, services resource types that are already available in the cloud formation templates that you can use and based on that you can create your templates. And if you wish to see that there is an option here as well, I'll just show you where you can see what are the service types or the type of resources that are available to us. So if you want to see that, you have to just click on this, these three buttons that you see here, the tabs that you see here, just click on this and you can go to registry, cloud formation registry. Here you will get the list of all the uh, service or resource types that you want or each of the services that are supported by your cloud formation. So let's suppose I want to go to EC2 again. So we have AWS auto scaling scaling policy. So you can just click on this and it will show you like this, the ARN of the policy that we have here of the resource type that we have. And it will give you the schema as well, where you can refer to this and you can create your uh, template. Now let's go back and actually see how it exactly has developed for us. So if we want to see the instance, we have to go to the EC2. So just click on EC2 and it would have created a new instance for us. So if you see, we have a new running instance and uh, see the name for the EC2 instance that I had mentioned was hello stack. If you click on this, we have the private IP. We have the public IPv4 DNS. We have the public IPv4 DNS for this one. There's the elastic IP for us. So there's the public IP that has been attached to this one. And if you see, uh, this goes with the default VPC. And if you wish to change it, you have to change it in your template. And also you can supply the subnet ID that you want and you can change it in your template as well. And what is the other thing that we had associated? This was security group. So if you see this is the hello stacks security group, if you can just click on this, you will see one inbound rule that was TCP port 22 and the source was 0.0.0 slash .0, 0. This was for the IPv4, all IP traffic to be allowed for SSH. And the next thing that I wanted to see was the Elastic IP. See, so there's the Hello Stacks Elastic IP that has been attached to this. So this has been allocated for us. But there was one more important thing that we missed out. I'll show you that. Go to Services and S3. Yes, we are going to see a bucket that has been created newly for our cloud formation. So this is the bucket that has been created. So CF hyphen templates. So there's a cloud formation template that I have. You can just click on this. You will see that it has been updated. If you click on this, there's the template ID that we have. So this one is the one that we uploaded initially. And actually this is what we have been using in our cloud formation as well. So if suppose I have already uploaded a template in my bucket, and if I want to create a template, then what I can do is I can just uh, go to cloud formation and I can click on create stack. So here we already know that the template is ready. And if I want to make use of the uh, template that I have already stored in AWS S3, then I can just click on this template and I can copy this object URL and I can actually paste it and I can click on next. Okay, so use this object URL to actually make use of the template. So now that we have created the stack, the next thing is for us to uninstall the stack. So let's go ahead and see this once again. So we have the events. So now everything has been created. So now I just want to delete the stack. Okay, so just click on delete. I want to see the progress right now. So whenever you click on delete or if you want to delete it, you will see the progress for that as well. So we just keep on refreshing. It will try to delete all the associations that we have. Or the resources it has provisioned using the cloud formation template. 
So if you see the hello stack is delete in progress and that is user initiated. That means that I have actually initiated the deletion of that particular stack. So now the IP association has been deleted. It is currently deleting the EC2 instance right now. And that is what we want, isn't it? It has to clean up everything that it has created. And that is one of the best reliefs that I feel when I use these templates. Let's wait for a few minutes for it to get cleaned up. So now it has completely deleted it. So hello stack, the logical ID is delete completed. So how to verify whether it has cleaned up everything or not? So if you go to the services and go to EC2, now the running instances is zero. Just click on this. Now it has terminated the instance that we have. And if you go to the elastic IPs, there are no elastic IPs available right now. It has already disassociated it and it has removed it. So that's a very good thing for us. And if you see no security group rules, anything, everything that it has created, actually it has deleted it. One thing it will not delete is S3 bucket because it is very important to preserve the templates. Okay, so this one. So we have to delete this as well. So click on delete. And because this bucket is not empty, you have to delete all objects inside it. So just click on empty bucket configuration and type in permanently delete. Just copy it actually. Just copy it and paste it and click on empty delete. So now two objects have been successfully deleted. Click on exit. And now just choose this and click on delete. And type the bucket name as it is very big. I will just copy and paste it and click on delete bucket. Yes, so now we have cleaned up everything. And if I come back to this cloud formation, so here we have stack sets, as I told you. So rather than creating stacks, you can create stack sets as well. So if you click on stack sets, you can actually provide the template is ready or you can select a template that we have. So I'll just uh, upload a template. I'll not create it, but I'll just show you how it exactly the form looks like. So just click on next. So here you see you can apply the stack set name that we have. You can provide uh, the T2 instance or the instance name. You have to provide the key pair name. I'll just give uh, some dummy name for this one. So you give the stack name. The stack description is already mentioned here. You give the parameters. You click on next. You give the tags. You just provide the role. I don't have any roles right now. So if you don't have any executions role, it will create it for you. So like AWS cloud formation stack set execution role and just click on next. So here, this is a major difference that you see here between stack and stack sets. So stack sets can be deployed into accounts or an organizational unit as well. So you can deploy stacks in accounts. So you can populate the account number here or the uh, file from which you want to populate the account names or the numbers. So you can upload a CSV file also, or you can provide 12 digit account numbers by separating them with commas. You can actually provide the account numbers here as well. If for those of the accounts that you want to deploy the stacks in or else you can just uh, deploy stacks in organization units or the organization unit numbers. So once you have done this, you have added some of the account numbers. You can just specify the region that you want. Let's suppose I have Asia Pacific Mumbai. I can just uh, do that for other regions like Hong Kong or Ireland at the same time. So I can deploy things or deploy stacks in multiple accounts in multiple regions. And I can have maximum concurrent account optional. So number of account per regions to which you can deploy stack at one time. The higher the number, the faster the operation. You can just provide basically like parallel execution of these stack deployments. So failure tolerance optional. So number of accounts per region for which stacks can fail before before cloud formation stops the operation in that region. So if the number of operations are stopped in one region, it does not continue in other regions. So lower the number, the safer the operations. I'll just enter my account number and click on next. So once you have done this, you can just review it and you can submit it. So it will create a stack set for you. So now that you have already understood how to create stack and stack sets, it's your time now to pull out a sample template from the AWS documentations and use it and create your own 
AWS Cloud Formation template and provision resources. I will actually attach this particular template on the code that I have. And I'll actually give you the link of the template as well in the description so that you can make use of it and you can create an experiment on that. And I would love to see how it worked out for you. So please do that. It actually helps you understand the concept better because until and unless you try it yourself, you'll never be able to understand and actually how it feels. So you have to understand the feel of how it actually works rather than actually seeing the video. You can actually do this by yourself because you already have a free tier account. I surely know that. And uh, if you don't, then please watch the video to create your own free tier account and uh, make use of it to create your first cloud formation stack and uh, learn things for free. But you have to pay for the resources that you create. So that is some things to be paid for, isn't it? So that's it for the demo for today. I hope you enjoyed the session that we had for today. If you did, please make sure that you like the video. It really helps the channel. And if you are new, you are most welcome. And please do subscribe so that I get another chance from you to provide better content in the future. And if you also want to be a part of the Hall of Fame members list, then please tag the channel with your certificates. In LinkedIn, it actually motivates me a lot and I really feel very happy that I am able to help you in any way possible. And if you would like to support this channel, then please hit the like button, comment on what you liked and what you didn't. And please do subscribe if you haven't already. So stay safe, stay healthy. I'll meet you in the next session for AWS. Until next time, it's Pytholic signing off.